Casey Fiesler. I am an associate professor of information science at University of Colorado Boulder. And a lot of the research that I do is around technology ethics and especially research ethics. I am part of a big project on research ethics for pervasive data in computational research. And that's a lot of what I'm talking about today. How do we think about research ethics for computational social science, especially when we are collecting data that is publicly available, like from social media? I'm Casey, and uh, my training is actually in human-centered computing and law. I'm going to talk very sparingly about law because as I will say at some point, uh, law and ethics are not the same thing and we are fortunate when they overlap. <laughs> um, so I think it's a really great thing that we're starting off uh, with the topic of ethics because what you really hate is to get it at the very end. <laughs> now you've been learning how to do this for a couple of weeks and here's the stuff you should have been thinking about all along. Um, sometimes I joke that being someone who studies technology ethics means that I just make slides that look like this over and over until I retire. Um, and you will see some of these come up again at various points. So one question we might start off with is, what is ethics anyway in this context? I am not going to try to answer this question for you at all. Um, in fact, during the course of all of this, I'm not really here to give you answers. I'm here to give you questions. So sometimes people will ask me, Casey, so you you've finished teaching ethics to the computer science students. When you're done with that, are they more ethical? <laughs> um, which is a very hard question to answer. But I also tend to think of instruction around things like ethics as not being about creating a more ethical person, <laughs> but in assuming that you all want to do the right thing. <laughs> everyone in this room, everyone wants to do the ethical thing, right? It's that we often don't know how to spot the problems or the issues. And sometimes what we should actually do about it is a bit elusive. But what I'm hoping is that through the course of this, I can give you a lot of things that you should be thinking about as you go about your work. I'm also going to give you a wrong answer to this question, though, um, which is that ethics for researchers with the IRB tells you you can do. When I say IRB here, I mean this is a bit of shorthand because I happen to be standing at a university in the United States. Uh, so an institutional review board is what academic institutions in the United States use to do ethics review. Um, you might see similar things in other countries. Sometimes they're called ethics review boards or ethics committees. Um, and in some places there isn't this kind of review at all. But in the United States specifically, the purview of an IRB is very narrow, right? So ethics review at US institutions is about human subjects research. Um, and this is defined in federal law. And human subjects research means either directly interacting with a person, a human, or collecting identifiable private information um, and or. Um, a lot of what you'll be talking about here, most of the research that you just heard about in that introduction would not fall under this definition, right? Um, I do a lot of actual human subjects research, interviewing people, surveys, this sort of thing. Um, but I also do uh, what one might consider computational social science or even qualitative um, work on trace data. I'm going to talk to you actually about some work that I did at some point that was analyzing comments on news articles as a data source. I did not get IRB approval for this project. 
because it does not fall under the, the definition of human subjects research. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that there are no ethical issues with this kind of research, right? Um, so for example, all of these are, are things that made headlines. Um, we have uh, data from dating sites, YouTube videos, uh, tweets, more dating sites, uh, facial recognition from images found online. Um, so these are often the kinds of data that you're talking about. And often we'll hear about research, sometimes even that sparks controversy, and it might not even be immediately obvious what the data source is, um, like the, the, the famous uh, Gaydar uh, study out of, out of Stanford, where they use off-the-shelf facial recognition to show that they could, with some accuracy, predict sexual orientation from a photograph. Uh, okay, how did they do that? Where did the data come from? Where do you get labeled data with sexual orientation? Because they didn't ask people, right? So that data came from a dating site. I don't think that it was Tinder, actually. <laughs> uh, but the point is there is a lot of data like this that's just, it's just there, right? And you'll be thinking about a lot of different sources of data. Um, and we've seen this kind of research for years now, right? And when I was finishing up my PhD in 2014, 2015, we were just starting to think about this stuff. Like, I was in a lab where we talked about research ethics a lot, and these conversations around like, oh, well, what about, what about the ethics of using tweets? Like, we were just starting to have these conversations like less than, than 10 years ago frequently, right? And actually since then, since uh, starting in 2015, I've been running um, workshops at a lot of different conferences, mostly in computer science around research ethics, especially research ethics that falls through these cracks of human subjects research. So especially like research ethics for using public data. And we just talk about the same questions over and over again in having, in, in having conversations about research ethics, especially for public data. What is public anyway? <laughs> um, when is or is ever consent appropriate? What about violations of terms of service? Um, how do we account for the fact that uh, even if we might think this is unreasonable, most people don't think that researchers are using, <laughs> are using their data. Um, what about things like stolen or leaked or deleted data, anonymization practices? How do we even create shared expectations in a single uh, discipline or 150 disciplines? Um, what kinds of precautions should we be taking for vulnerable populations in particular? Um, and what are the, our obligations? to those communities. And these are just, again, questions that I hear over and over, and I'll address uh, some of these, but I don't necessarily have answers uh, <laughs> to any of these again, but things to think about. But one of the big questions that we often start talking about when having this conversation is, okay, so I want to do a research project using trace data. How do you decide whether it's okay for your definition of okay? to collect data? I hear two answers most commonly to when you ask someone this question. The first one is, well, what do the terms of service say? I'm guessing that some of you might have read terms of service at some point. <laughs> um, perhaps even for this exact, uh, for this exact reason. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some work now uh, that I did with Brian Keegan at my university and Nathan Beard, who's a PhD student at University of Maryland now. Um, I want to point out something real quick before I continue this conversation about terms of service, which is legal and ethical are not the same thing. <laughs> um, I'm actually not going to be talking much about the legal 
issues here, um, in part because they tend to be less interesting to me and, in, and mostly less important <laughs> to me. Um, but for what it's worth, recent court cases suggest that it's probably not a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act <laughs> violation to scrape against terms of service. Um, I also, um, uh, perhaps not my, not the area of expertise that I am known for now, but my dissertation was all about copyright law. I also think that copyright law is not the interesting part of what's happening here, <laughs> but I'm happy that to, to, talk about, uh, to talk to you guys about fair use and copyright law and that sort of thing during the breaks if, if you want to. Um, but what I want to think about here is ethical issues in violating terms of service. Um, so, for example, if a website says, do not do academic research here. <laughs> um, and uh, FetLife, which is a social network for kink and fetishes, uh, is the only website I've ever seen <laughs> that has this explicit prohibition. And you can imagine why that might be, right? So if we wanna talk about the legality of violating terms of service, um, this is basically the same as, as any other website when, that might have a prohibition on, um, on scraping or research. Uh, but you might think that the ethical issues are a little bit different here because of the very specific prohibition for you as academic researchers. And you might have seen many provisions that look just like this, right? Or variations thereon. Um, and so as part of a research project a few years ago, we analyzed the data scraping provisions for over 100 different social media um, and social networking websites. I use Yik Yak as an example here, actually, because this is a website that started my interest in this topic. Because when I was a PhD student at Georgia Tech, Yik Yak was actually based in Atlanta. We were one of the first universities to have it. And we were talking about how interesting it would be <laughs> to get data from Yik Yak in my research lab. And me being the buzzkill lawyer, I went and read the terms of service. <laughs> and I said, hey, you know, technically we're not allowed to do this. And my advisor said, well, we know them, we'll just ask them. And they said no. <laughs> and then guess who didn't study Yik Yak? <laughs> and meanwhile, other researchers are, are, are publishing Yik Yak papers, and we're just, huh. <laughs> um, But I want to use this as an example real quick, actually, because I think this is an interesting one, because it's, uh, if you're not familiar with Yik Yak, it is a location-based um, ephemeral social networking site. Um, it went away for a while, and then it came back last year. Uh, it was very, but it was very, very popular on college campus in around uh, 2015. Anonymous, location-based, ephemeral, the data goes away. So you can imagine why Yik Yak might not want people to be creating archives of data from a website where the expectation of the users is that it's going away. Right? And this is not the only site that's like that. But do they say that here? Do they say this is why? <laughs> no, they don't. And they almost never do. Um, I don't expect you to take any meaning from, from this table. Um, this is a way that we coded all of these different data scraping provisions for things like um, whether they prohibited uh, only automated scraping or manual scraping as well or anything, and whether they had any kind of like special provisions, whether it was just for personal. Anyway, the point of this is super inconsistent. Um, if you read the terms of service for Instagram, that tells you nothing about the terms of service for Yik Yak, right, when it comes to data scraping. But they're also, super vague, <laughs> like don't scrape. Things that don't matter <laughs> include what kind of data for the most part, what you're gonna do with it, who you are, what the expectations of the norm and the norms of the users are, are basically 
all of the kinds of things that you think might matter for an ethical decision, like what I just mentioned with respect to Yik Yak. Um, so that answer to, is it okay for me to collect data here, if you are making a decision solely based on terms of service. So if the terms of service prohibit it, I cannot collect data. If the terms of service say nothing about it, I can collect data. That strategy has two major problems. One is that it assumes that violating terms of service is inherently unethical. I would argue that that is not true. Um, and one of the reasons I say that, that, that I don't think that's true is in part because you can put whatever you want in a terms of service. You might, in fact, put in a terms of service. Um, anyone can scrape data here. Unless uh, you are an academic researcher and you're going to say bad things about our platform. Um, there's actually a provision that is like getting very close to saying that in parlors, <laughs> in terms of service. Um, and the other thing is that there are some reasons for perhaps the good of society where we might want to make sure that not only people who have the access that data are the only ones who can study it, right? This conversation has come up a lot with respect to Facebook in particular. Um, Facebook is not the only platform for which this is relevant, but we've just had a whole lot of conversations about them in particular. Um, and there are a lot of amazing researchers at Facebook. Um, a lot of amazing researchers in our community who are doing really cool work and they're publishing papers, um, lots of them, and the data that they have access to is amazing. But they're still a company with corporate interests. Um, and this is true for any platform. Honestly, this is true for if you build a new platform, what's your incentive to want to know how that platform harm society and then tell everyone about it, <laughs> right? Um, I will give uh, some sort of rare kudos to uh, Twitter. Twitter did an, a, an audit on one of their algorithms a couple of years ago and published a scientific paper about how it was biased. You don't see that very much, right? So the argument is that we might want external researchers to be able to study the data that comes from platforms, to be able to look at their impact on society, et cetera. And a lot of, and, and a lot of platforms, including Facebook, are trying to find ways to open up access to data in part for that, for that reason. Um, Facebook has run into some problems with this. Uh, more movement even recently in trying to make this happen. And in fact, right now, in the EU, there's a proposed law, the Digital Services Act, that if passed, might require platforms to open up data to researchers more. Of course, this becomes complicated when you consider that also Facebook in particular has gotten into some hot water when it comes to research happening on their platform. And so there's actually a really fine line uh, to walk here. And a lot of the different things that I'm going to talk about today have these tensions. The tension, for example, between protecting people's privacy and open science would be a great example. But also, we don't want to think that violating terms of service is the only thing that could make data collection unethical. Um, and so actually, now let's put aside terms of service <laughs> for the rest of this and, and think about these other kinds of things. So the, th the answer that I actually hear a lot more than talking about terms of service is, well, is the data public, right? These, this, these are the magic words when it comes to trace data. Is it public? So, for example, um, OkCupid, the dating site, technically public, right? 
Um, and in 2016, there was a big controversy because a researcher scraped all of OkCupid and put the data set online without any anonymization. Um, I don't know if any of you use OkCupid or have in the past, but the way that the matching algorithm on that site works is that you answer many, 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 many questions about yourself. And uh, from uh, what's bigger, the sun or the earth <laughs> kind of question to like extremely detailed question about people's sexual preferences. Um, and at the time, people were pointing out, you know, You've got people's usernames here. You've got their locations. It would not be hard to identify a lot of people in this data set. And when called out about this on Twitter, the researcher said, uh, but the data's already public. And this is such a common response that this was the title of my collaborator, Michael Zimmer's paper in 2010. And he has a Google, a Google alert set for this phrase. <laughs> the data is already public. Um, and publicness of data is one of those like get out of IRB free cards, right? Um, and so this is often the sole ethical heuristic for using trace data. So now I'm gonna spend like an hour and a half telling you why that should not be the case. <laughs> Um, so, again, this, this paper was written in 2010, uh, you know, an early paper about this kind of thing, and it was with respect to Facebook. Uh, even at that time, Facebook data was pretty hard to get, but we started getting data that was much easier to get. Um, in 2014, Zainab Tufekci wrote, a paper about social media big data and made a point that I think uh, is very important, which is why do we use Twitter data so much? Is Twitter so great? Like is Twitter what most people are using? Is Twitter the representation? No. We use Twitter data because it's easy to get. Um, and in this paper, she talks about Twitter as essentially the fruit fly of academic research. That Twitter has the model organism problem. We don't, people don't study the fruit fly because the fruit fly is like the organism that's most like every, no, it like has a really short lifespan, so it's really easy to study. <laughs> Same thing, right? You know, if we were gonna study social media data based on uh, like global representation, we would have thousands and thousands and thousands of papers each year using Facebook data, not Twitter data, right? But Twitter is one of the big ones, regardless of the reason. Um, and the point made earlier about how this has some representation issues uh, is important as well. The exclusions of big data. But this is the state of the world. I'm also going to talk about Reddit later, <laughs> but in, tw in uh, 2017, when I started doing research in this area, Twitter was definitely the big one, and myself and my collaborator, Nick Preferis, who's at Arizona State University now, wanted to answer a pretty simple question, which was, how do Twitter users feel about this? Because we weren't talking about this a lot at the time, because it wasn't people. It was just data. Like a, tw a data set of 10 million tweets, that's not people, it's, it's data. It's public, right? So we conducted a survey of Twitter users about how they feel about the use of their tweets and research, and in particular, the contextual factors that might influence that. Now, you might be thinking, about the totally obvious selection bias in this study, right? <laughs> we surveyed people about how they feel about research. So people had to opt in to take a survey. We cannot survey people without their consent. 
And when we did the study, we're like, there is a very good chance that we get the survey results back and everyone's like, yeah, research is great. Um, because why would people who hate research participate in our research study about how they feel about research? <laughs> um, that wasn't our finding, but I bring this up because A, I want you to realize that I recognize the selection <laughs> bias, but B, I actually think that the attitudes that you're going to see here are better <laughs> than if we were able to get, a, to get a sample without that kind of selection bias. So first of all, 61% of the people we surveyed had absolutely no idea this was a thing. <laughs> um, and, and anecdotally, I hear this a lot, right? I talk to people about my research. They, like, I'm like, yeah, you know, I study like research ethics of scientists using tweets or YouTube videos or Reddit posts or whatever. And they're like, wait, what? Why would scientists read my tweets? Um, this might seem obvious to you that like this is a data source, but to the average person, no. <laughs> um, we also ask people, well, do you think that's allowed? Like, are researchers permitted to use tweets without permission? And almost half were like, no, definitely not. They must be breaking some kind of rules here. Um, and of those people who thought that this has to be against the rules, 61% uh, thought, thought, well, they're clearly like breaking some kind of ethical rule for researchers. Um, and also 23% were like, yeah, this is also definitely a violation of Twitter's terms of service. Um, and that one's interesting because Twitter's, uh, actually not their terms of service, their privacy policy is like, hey, just so you know, university researchers might be using your tweets. <laughs> of course, people don't read terms of service, right? Which is another reason why if we're thinking about the ethical issues with like following terms of service, you can't assume that, well, their terms of service doesn't prohibit research, so therefore people must know there's going to be research there. <laughs> um, the terms of service are not a particularly good proxy for knowledge of anything, because people don't read them. <laughs> we also asked people, well, regardless of you know, whether you think it's allowed, and actually regardless of how you feel about your tweets specifically, should researchers be able to do this? Um, and most said no, actually. But more interestingly, we asked people to explain why they felt this way. And this is where the contextual factor started to come up. Well, does the research serve a greater purpose? Was I told about it? Is it a large scale study or is it my individual tweet being picked out of this, right? We went into this study not, like our, our question wasn't, should researchers use tweets? I am not gonna do a study where I tell researchers they can't use tweets. Like if I thought there was any chance that was gonna be the answer, like I was a second year professor, I was not gonna go that there, right? <laughs> Um, and actually, throughout the course of all of this, I'm, not, I'm never suggesting that we should not be doing this kind of work. The important thing is, how do we do it? So this is where uh, contextual factors become really important. Um, and I don't expect you to take meaning quickly out of, out of this chart, but we asked people about all these different things, like were you informed? Uh, was it analyzed along with millions of tweets? Was it a protected account? Was it deleted? Was it analyzed by a computer program or a person? Uh, these kinds of things. And the point of this is that these kinds of things matter. Um, and so let me give you a few examples. So the purpose of the study is one thing that matters. Um, as someone on the previous slide said, does it serve a greater purpose? Um, we also saw a number of people who uh, were unhappy that like this, this work was probably being done by like evil liberal academics, um, which, I, which is a, a point that I'll come back to later as well. So, but to these people, it mattered who they were, who was doing the research. Also, the content of the tweet, and this seems really obvious, 
right? Um, well, is it personal? Is it embarrassing? Is it identifying? What's the tweet? People have thought about anonymity. Is it tied to their name? Um, and also issues with dissemination. Um, well, do I get to read the findings of the paper? Um, uh, was I credited? Was my handle in there? Um, people feel differently about that as well. Um, but I think the big point here, and this looks similar to a slide that I have a moment ago, is that data collection decisions should not be context agnostic. Like, these things matter. What's the data? What are you going to do with it? Who are you? What are the norms of the users? And the big point here is that all of these things are not just publicness. Publicness is a, a floor, not a ceiling. <laughs> when it comes to, like, no, we do not want to be studying not public data, right? Um, so an example of this would be like a private health-related forum where you have to have a login to read it. Uh, you're not, I hopefully think that most people would not think it was okay to just use that kind of data without consent, like non-public data, or like the Slack channel for this institute, like just taking the data from that w without people's permission. Um, but if we consider publicness uh, as a floor, as a bare minimum, there are a lot of other things we should be thinking about as well. Um, and I'm going to go through a few of these. Um, this is not a comprehensive list of all of the types of things that you might want to be thinking about. But I'm going to go through a number of things that have come up specifically in my research and specific cases that, I, that I've heard about. So I'm going to go through a couple of these before, before we take a break. <laughs> so first of all, it's important to not think of data as just data if that data comes from people. So I'm, I'm mostly thinking about social media data and the kinds of stuff that I'm talking about here because that's such a common piece of trace data for human behavior. Um, you could imagine some other categories of data. But the important thing here is that it's not all the same. So here's a tweet. A, a tweet that I got when searching for breakfast in Twitter in 2018 when I first gave a talk like this. <laughs> um, so here's someone tweeting about what they had for breakfast. Um, at the time, I also looked for some tweets on some other topics. Um, and another tweet that I found had someone talking about being HIV positive. And I was able to find this by doing a search for HIV positive in Twitter. Um, this is actually an obfuscated tweet. It's paraphrased. I don't even remember what the original <laughs> tweet was at this point. But why would I even need to use that tweet on a slide, um, let alone published in an academic paper where someone could search for it and find that person again pretty easily? The idea that these two tweets are equivalent and should be treated exactly the same is absurd, right? These are not the same. Um, there are some types of data that requires more care. The same would be true if you were doing human subjects research, right? So like I've done many, 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 many protocols for the IRB from my, the ethics review board at my university. And sometimes I do projects where I'm asking computer science students, hey, what did you think about this assignment in this class? <laughs> uh, very recently, I've started doing a project about uh, type 1 diabetes, talking to people about very personal health data. The hoops that I have to jump through for the IRB are different, which is completely appropriate, because some kinds of content is more sensitive than others. So there was a study conducted uh, that was published in 2018 where they looked for 
uh, tweets in PubMed articles. So PubMed is all medical, health, published papers. Lots of public health research uses tweets. So 72% of the articles that use Twitter data quoted tweets directly, and they could lead back to the Twitter user 84% of the time. And these are tweets about medical stuff, right? These are not what did you have for breakfast tweets. Um, so again, these, these things are different. This reminder that data does come from people, and here it's people talking about their health conditions. Let me give you another data is people example. Um, this is from a published paper uh, that is matching these photographs to BMI, body mass index. So there's a data set that, um, that was based on helping AI to be able to determine BMI from a photograph of just your face. So in order to do that, what do you need? You need photographs of faces and you need BMI. So there are a couple of different ways you could do this. One, you bring in a bunch of people, you ask them their height and weight, and you take a photograph of their face and you create a data set, which would be a lot of work. Or you can go to the subreddit <laughs> where people are sharing their weight loss journeys and they're saying, here's my height and weight and here's my photograph, right? So I have no idea if the people in the subreddit ever found out about the study or have any idea uh, that it happened. Um, even the people who were shown in a paper with the bar over their eyes. But I want you to think for a minute about the people in this data. Why do you share a photograph of yourself with your height and, <laughs> height and weight? This is a very vulnerable thing to decide to show this to a bunch of strangers on the internet. And these are often folks who, and we know this based on the stories that they're sharing here as well, don't even want to talk to their doctors about this. People often lie about their weight to their doctors. <laughs> um, or you know, don't want to be weighed or, or whatever. It's a very vulnerable thing to show weight loss photos to strangers on the internet and probably weren't expecting that to be used in any other way, right? Um, my understanding is actually that this data set uh, has been removed, uh, in part because of these kinds of ethical concerns. Um, but let me give you uh, another example of this kind of thing. Uh, there were researchers who were using YouTube videos of people sharing gender transition stories to train facial recognition, um, to be able to still be able to do facial recognition for, for gender, um, depending on where, so, where someone was in a gender transition. Um, and this was a story in Verge about this at the time. And this part here particularly struck me. So uh, there was someone whose transition picture was in a scientific paper, just like the example that I just showed you. Um, and she didn't know about this until it came to her attention much later and talked about how it felt like a violation of privacy. Um, so there was no consent. Uh, here, but also this is another example of why would someone share this on YouTube, right? Very vulnerable. You're doing this to help your community. If you're make, putting up a YouTube video about your gender transition, you are not doing that for science, right? Um, I do think that norms around these things are, tr are changing. This is another data set that is gone. Um, this data set was retracted. 
uh, again, because, in part because of, of ethical concerns, and I think these are things that are changing, but these are really important examples of remembering the humans in the data. So I wanna talk now a bit about informed consent, or rather not informed consent, but informing and consenting. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk now a little bit about a particular research ethics controversy that you might have heard about, uh, the Facebook Emotional Contagion Study. So this happened in 2014. So actually, as I was finishing up my PhD, and I mentioned that people were starting to talk more about these kinds of things, and this was one of the flashpoints in the social computing research community that kicked off conversations about research ethics that we were not having before. Um, the short version of this is that some academic researchers worked with researchers at Facebook, um, and they wanted to test the psychological phenomenon of emotional contagion, which is basically, if you're around people who are happy, you're happier, if you're around people who are sad, you're sadder. Um, and so the question was, does this happen on social media? And so, as you all, I'm sure, know, Facebook has an algorithm that is constantly tweaking the kinds of stuff that you see on your newsfeed. So it's just a matter of putting people into experimental conditions where their newsfeed was tweaked based on sentiment analysis to show uh, more positive or less positive content, and then doing that same kind of analysis on what that person posted afterwards. And the initial press release and the first couple of news stories about this was researchers show that emotional contagion happens on social media. I mean, it was a very small effect, but it was significant. Um, and then the headlines after that were Facebook researchers are manipulating you to make you sad. Um, an exercise that you might find useful, and we'll talk a little bit more about this kind of speculation as I go on in this talk. Um, it's always a good idea to imagine the worst possible headline someone could write about your research. I sometimes have my students do this. Um, now, whether the sort of outcry about this was appropriate or not, it was an interesting way to look at how people were reacting to research. So I talked about the selection bias in my study earlier. How do you find out how people feel about research if they don't want to participate in your research study about how much they hate research? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I did my own study of trace data. Um, we wanted to find out what people were upset about when it came to this particular study. And so we analyzed comments on news articles about it. Um, and there were a lot of interesting uh, findings here, a lot of which aren't particularly relevant to issues of trace data, which is what I'm mostly talking about here. Um, but I wanted to bring up one thing that came up in our findings that I think is relevant generally, which was this idea of I didn't come here to be your science experiment. I'm not on Facebook <laughs> to jump in a Petri dish. I'm not a lab rat. Um, the findings that we got here, and a little bit out of that survey, like I gave you the example of like the person who said they didn't want liberal academics studying them, um, there are some people who fundamentally do not want to be part of your science experiment. They do not want their trace data in your study. Now, I'm not saying this as a way to suggest that this means no more computational social science <laughs> using trace data ever. But this is an important thing for you to know. Because there are then certain types of content that you might want to treat differently, or certain ways that you might want to be careful um, to assuage potential uh, concerns that people might have like this. Um, and in this case, 
We actually saw also a lot of disagreement about how people felt in this case. And it was in part because they had different ideas of like what Facebook is for and what their relationship is to it. And also, to be frank, there are just a lot of people who think that Facebook is evil and will absolutely ascribe worst possible intentions to anything ever. Um, and again, in the survey that we did about Twitter, there was a, someone who said like, well, is this for the greater good, right? I feel differently if this is for science versus if this is for like uh, market research or something like that. So these kinds of things matter as well. Um, and then of course we have the examples of like data where someone explicitly will not give you their consent. Or in this case, and this is the FetLife data scraping provision, provision again, they said you can get consent from the platform. So I am not going to suggest that anyone should try to get individual consent from a million people on Twitter. Like, you're gonna do public health research about COVID or whatever, I'm not, I am not suggesting that you need to be tweeting out a consent form <laughs> to every person in your data set. Um, but there are some things that you might consider. Um, if any of you have ever used Reddit data, a thing that you might do is get consent from the subreddit, for example. Um, this is a message that was posted to our drugs, um, which was, uh, well, actually, here they, they, the moderators on our drugs knew that research was happening based on their subreddit. And they basically said, we know that because of Reddit's terms of service and the fact that they have an API and all that, we can't stop you from scraping data. But we would really ask that you announce yourself to the moderators because it's the right thing uh, to do ethically. Now, this is something that someone could do anywhere. There, there are some subreddits also that just say, don't research us. And you might be thinking also, but what if I ask the moderators and they say no? And the question you might ask yourself is, why do they say no? <laughs> right, so this goes back to the sort of like legal versus ethical thing. Um, and then you might ask yourself, well, but what if I wanna do it anyway? <laughs> and then the question I would ask you is, why? So something that I want you to be thinking about sort of throughout all of this, and in some ways, this is a simplistic way of thinking about research ethics, but it's appropriate. Um, harm versus benefit. There's a lot of research that people do because it's never been done before. <laughs> Have any of you ever reviewed a paper where that's literally the only justification for the project at all? Like there's absolutely nothing about why this should be done except we are the first to do X. <laughs> there are a lot of things that haven't been done because they're not worth doing. <laughs> um, and there is research that absolutely might have benefit that might outweigh something um, like the comfort of uh, the people who are being studied. An example I might give actually is looking at arguably like toxic communities. So there are a lot of people who do research on say explicitly racist online communities. Communi there used to be, I mean, I think they're mostly gone now. Go Reddit. Um, but like there were subreddits that were explicitly devoted to racism and misogyny and fat shaming and these sorts of things. There might legitimately be really important things that we need to learn about these kinds of interactions. And if they are happening publicly, I think that you could make um, a benefit versus harm analysis in part because if this were not our drugs, if this were one of those communities, a researcher 
might be actively putting themselves in danger by telling the community, right? But in these cases, you need to be thinking about the benefits and you need to be thinking about the way that you're doing the research. Um, and we'll talk about some of those things as well. Okay, I have, all right, I have one more point um, on this topic and then we're gonna take a break before I go into some more things. This was another finding from the Twitter study. We asked people, well, would you want to know if your tweet was in a research study? And the answer is yes, most people want to know. And 83% of people said they'd want to read the paper. Now, is this actually true? Would they really want to read the paper? Maybe. Um, but this is an interesting point. Inform and consent are not the same thing. You can potentially inform people without consenting them. And again, I don't necessarily mean, you know, contacting, sending an email to everyone who's in your data set of a million tweets. <laughs> um, but let's say, for example, you study a subreddit. You could post the paper in that subreddit when you're done with it. Again, if it's not going to be something that's going to put you in, in danger or, or something like that. Um, or you might tweet to a hashtag. Um, one of my PhD students did a study of black Twitter recently, tweeted about it to the black Twitter hashtag. Um, I, write, I have done a bunch of studies of fandom. I write Tumblr posts about them. Um, I've made TikToks about research. Um, we very often study communities without giving anything back to them at all, not even the knowledge that we gained from that community. Um, and I will talk more about that a bit again later. So some takeaways from thinking about research ethics. One of the most important things is to be thinking about it at all. Sometimes this means speculating about possible harms, thinking through the kinds of questions that I just took you all through, and also writing about your ethical considerations when, for example, you publish a paper. This is also how we learn from each other. If you want to learn more about my work and the work from my collaborators, you can find out more about the Pervade Pervasive Ethics for Computational Research Project. And also I am, of course, all over social media so that everyone can study my tweets. You can find me on Twitter at C. Fiesler and on TikTok at Professor Casey.